Hello and welcome to Back in My Day. We are now going up to Michael Laverne's house to interview him. Today we are interviewing Michael Laverne. Hi Michael. Um, can you tell me about your family? Uh, I was the, the middle of three children. My brother was older and my sister was younger. My brother went to college and, and he became a priest. He went to St. John's College in Warford. And when he was ordained <coughs> a priest, he went to America. Because of his poor health, he was unlikely to survive in, in the climate we have here in Ireland. And my sister then joined the Good Shepherd nuns in Limerick, and she was up there for a good, good number of years. And since then, she has she's now retired. And um, what about your parents? Uh, again, my mother lived to be a ripe old age, a decent age. She was eighty-four years. But I never knew my father, because he, he died when I was only three. His, his health wasn't good and he died 52 years, I think he was. And um, anything about your grandparents? Do you remember anything about them? Well, you see, because my mother now was, was, was young enough, but she was the, she was the youngest of her family. And again, the story was, was like my father's family. There was uh, quite a few of them there. I think there was nine or ten. And um, a few of those brothers of my mother were priests also. And one of them spent his life in California, in America. And the other man uh, served in the diocese here, Waterford and Lismore. And I suppose his most notable achievement, if, that, if that's what it is, he was the man who welcomed Ronald Reagan to Ballyporeen when, when he came there. And uh, I don't know how relevant it is, but it's funny. Uh, he, he had been in a car accident a short time before, so he had, was using crutches. So they had him sitting down outside the priest's house in Ballyborean, uh, outside the front door, when the Reagans were, were about to leave. So they came out then to shake hands with him and all that. You know. And the Irishman broke out in the manual when he shook hands with Nancy Reagan. And what he said to her was, good luck now, ma'am, and save home. <laughs> a, good, a good Irish tradition. You know, mm. uh, you said to yourself, she, she's only going to meet you somewhere, yeah. you know. <laughs> it, uh, it managed to draw a smile from Nancy's face, and that was a difficult thing to do. Yes. <laughs> Do you have any good memories, like when you went to the beach with your brothers and sisters, did anything funny happen? Or to the beach? Is that what yeah. Said? If you went to the... Did you go to like the beach or any... Go like for a walk in the woods or something? Well, you see, transport was, was rather scarce when I was young. And um, it was the end of the... Coming towards the end of of the war years. And during that time there were no private cars on the road because petrol was very scarce and very dear. And we had to depend on England for those things. Eh? And so there was uh, rationing of petrol. You could only buy a small 
couple of gallons in per month. So you could only make uh, necessary journeys. Anything you mentioned about cars? Do you remember the, who had the first car in this area? Who got the first car? Well, certainly, like uh, my father would have been amongst them. You know. mm. He had a baby Ford. It was, um, as I recall, I think it was registered about 1938. Before that would be. Before the before the start of the war, and I think basically that it was in '39 more or less that, that Ireland became in, involved. Uh, there was John Kennedy. He lived up in Derrygra. There was O'Brien. Lived in your time. What was the car itself like? How did you start it in that, compared with cars now? What, oh, sure. It must have been uh, a very different type. We had to, uh, they, they would be very, very primitive. This is the only word describes them, you know. Uh, not too easy to start at all, because the cars at that time, it was, just, it was difficult to start. You know, from, as the years went by, they, they got better and better and better, you know. Uh, we, often, often I saw the car being towed by a walking horse. And the, the horse pulled it, you see, and then you could start the start. same as you yeah. shove it, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who else had cars around then? You mentioned Kennedy. Who else would have had cars? Well, A lot of the time, you see, when 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 the war and the, all the private cars were off the road anyhow, and uh, it was a long, long time. And if you wanted to go anywhere, you had to hire a, a hackney car, as they call them, taxis now. Um, Michael, can you tell us about roughly how many families, people lived here when you were young? Uh, not in this house in particular, because this house was, was only built for my father. Uh, the old house that he lived in was down in the yard, and um, in my memory it was only used as a, an outhouse for where some of the workmen might go to uh, cut up the timber for the fire on a wet day. Were there any houses back towards Loch Ryan from here? But, uh, yeah, there was the Costigan family now. There was um, probably five or six in, the, in that family anyway. A lot of the country people moved to, to, to towns or cities to, to get employment. And then they married and lived in those places. It certainly applied to the Costigan girls. On this road here now you only had you only had Lalf Warren's house below, which was a Dogan family that was there in my time, in my young days. Okay. What are the main changes in your area over the years? Mm. What about electricity now? Would that be when did that yes, what uh, do you remember about that? The electricity came here uh, nineteen fifty. As a matter of fact, at that particular time, there was nobody living here. We were scattered. And, and um, the ESB uh, rented the place as an office while they were, while they were doing, putting up the, the, the electric lines, you know, the, the poles and the wires and all that. That was in the early 50s. 50, 51, around that time. It, 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 it opened all the doors, so to speak, you know, because once you had electricity, well, 
as well as having light in every room in the house and things like that. And you could have, you know, a big a bit of power for lamps that you could see outside of the house, you know. What about heating then? Oh yes, of course, that, that, that brought the heating as well. But uh, in the early days, uh, times were still uh, not very good. You know, wages were low and uh, everything was, was cheaper. So people didn't have a lot of money. And uh, they had to, as we used to say, play it by ear. I just put in the initially now, maybe into the houses you needed, electric plugs. You now, if you had one or two of them around the kitchen, you could plug in an electric kettle and, and an electric iron. And that might be the, the extent of it, you know. Agriculture changed quite a lot, you know, because uh, I thought it was, a, it was to do with the coming of the electricity. Because before that, uh, milking machines had arrived, and but they were driven by a little petrol engine before the before the rural electrification came around. Um, what games and pastimes would you have played at home when you were young? Well, we had we had a playing pitch, as you can see, <laughs> in front of the door there. <laughs> uh, myself and my brother, and we were stuff and boys there, but hardly each and took the ball around from one to the other. And uh, my sister used to attempt to join us, but it never lasted very long because uh, the two macho males, you see, and didn't think it's a good idea. <laughs> but uh, well, one very amusing thing happened. Uh, on Sundays, my mother used to get the pony tackled up and head back towards Ballyluby Parish, where she came from. She had a lot of relationships, a lot of them. And she had visited them all. But John and myself were out there and we were poking the ball around, and she arrived out there with the pony and trap and get on board. So it was dropped the hollies and hit, hit it off the road. But the following day, when we went to pick up the hollies, it was there was only one. John's holly was gone. And some of the boys at school uh, told them that there was a, a van of the itinerant stone in McLaughlin, and that they saw him playing Holly, and that his heart was like John's Holly. So he decided to go down and investigate, and sure enough, the holly was in the hands of one of the itinerants down there. So he politely asked him, like, give me a few shots with it, you see, and he gave it to him and he ran away home with his holly. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good one, wasn't good it? Good one. Oh, steal the holly out of the lens. Steal it, steal it back. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. <laughs> with justice. <laughs> but, um, Any other games or pastimes you used to play then? Well, you see, in, 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 in Grange now, I need the whole, and we did play a bit of hurling and kind of football without him, without him, but only a, a rubber ball. But um, it, it all had, had to be organised by ourselves. And uh, we remember playing game against uh, the lads from then Bairn Tom, what's the name of the school there? Up in Rathkeven. Rathkeven, yeah. Rathkeven, yeah. Some of the lads up there, they'll make contact now with the like of the uh, 
uh, John Keaton and Dick Keaton, you know. So we, we, we I remember on a couple of occasions anyway, having, di- having a Holland game above it, a field that's known as the stream there above and down from Keating, so. And uh, they were a, might have been an annual fixture, but there was, there was quite a few of them played. Regular enough, yeah. Yeah. And um, did you play anything other than hurling at school? Mm. We used to play around us, which was a some, something you could play play properly, because at the crossroads there it was <coughs> there was a there was good room there. The girls in those days had to, their playground was 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 a cemetery around the church. At playtime, that's where they had to go. And, s- and stay within the boundary of the, <laughs> the walls. Did boys and girls play together or did they play separately? Separate. And what games would girls play different games to boys? Like what games would they play? Well, was it be, they'd be very separate. There, there, there was no, no game at all. No mixing with the boys and the girls. The girls were, the graveyard was their playground. This is a dangerous place. I imagine so. There was a big cross there uh-huh. on, on, a, on a plinth, place between the between the main door and the road. And there was there was there was I think two steps around it, you know, here, you know, up here. And I suppose the the cross was just ordinary plain wood. It was it was, it was supported by. A big bear, two big bears of iron coming from one at this side and one at the other side. And they were bolted onto the cross bell of the cross. But, but one day, one of those iron bears fell down and hit a girl on the head. Well, they were kind of skimmed that she could have been killed. They were, they were cross was kind of gone rotten, you know, and they had to keep paying, they didn't paying to It was an evil one. Is it the girls play then, or what did they do at break times? So? No, I suppose this kind of hide and go seek thing, you know, what could you do inside in the church yard, you know, with all the obstructions. Yeah. But um, yeah, they, they amused themselves some, some way. <laughs> and um, after school, would you have played any games in the castle? No, uh, for a good, good few years now, my brother and myself, we used to trot on over to, to Loch Ryan and uh, John Hannan would be around my sa- same age as me almost. And uh, lo and behold, he had an uncle, a priest, that bought him a, a football, which was so we were able to go and play football with a real football, not, not a, a make-do one, for as long as it lasted. <laughs> <laughs> and Babs Keaton's mother's house was a good carrot house, was it? Oh, it was, yes, it was. Then or the home place in uh, Dan and... Yeah, well, then you, then you enjoyed you, you see, there was, there was nothing for people to do, really. Only play a few games of cards. Mm-hmm. You know? People weren't, uh, didn't have transport. Only bicycles and things. Mm-hmm. And uh, you'd have to, you know, you, you just couldn't get about. So you, you played yourself for Tipperary. You were obviously did very well at hurling and football. Just well, I was a nearly person. Mm. That is to say that. I was nearly good enough, and and it it, it meant that that uh, I did get to play a few times with with the county junior teams and things like that. And I played funny enough, and it, 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 
It's only recently I thought about it. Uh, I played in a couple of league league matches in football. I played in Saint Clamell one day now play, playing football against Slayer. And I played in Limerick, Kerry Grounds, against Limerick. Uh, I don't know what they are from the beginning or did I come on, but I played it. And the paper the following morning gave me credit for scoring a goal for Tipperary. And it is debatable who scored the goal, <laughs> but nobody only myself and the fellow I was playing on knew about Right. We were in the square, like, but legally there. But the ball spun. And a bit of goalie. He thought naturally it was going to come in here. But the minute it hit the ground, it did a kind of a. From, from the spin that was on the ball, I don't know if it was your man's throw or mine. But I was thrown nearly out like this, and your man had me choked. <laughs> We'll give you credit for it anyway. We'll definitely in the paper the man else to give it. Yeah, we, we, we want his, history records it. History will record. So what was life on the farm, Michael? Well, uh, I my farming was I turned over at an early stage to to tillage rather than rather than cattle and cows or things. Uh, <clears throat> it was at the time, in days gone by, farming was generally a bit of this and a bit of that. You know, people would maybe have 10 or 12 or so cows and, and some sheep maybe and cattle. And then have some, some crops like wheat, barley, oats. You know. But as time went on, uh, that changed, and people tended to uh, concentrate on maybe one particular firm, like dairy. Now, for instance, there. Uh, when I was young, the people didn't have ten, twelve cows, and maybe five or six cows. Whereas nowadays, people have as many as a hundred cows or two hundred cows in some cases. And um, how are the crops grown and harvested? Well, I, I I had a full range of machinery. Like other than, and there was only one one occupation that I that my neighbour John Hanlon used to uh, plant the corn. Now I got a, a corn did myself as well, but so sometimes uh, you, it was handier to get somebody else to. So the weather was bad. You know. But it was an easy life, you see. Was, uh, easier than the daring was a seven day week. So that wasn't for me. Plus the fact that in the early days we didn't have water. The only water we had was a, a pond. And it was way in one part, one part of the farm. Until the same as we got the piped water. Tell me about the trashing day. The which? The trashing day. Trashing day as well. The trashing days were a thing of the past when I was in Chile's but I can well remember when I was a young fellow here. And and uh, that time combines hadn't been invented, or if they had, they were over in America or somewhere. <laughs> they were in this country. And there we had this. It was, it was a big occasion, the trashing day. Uh, depending on, on, on how much corn you had, you might get a tra you might get in the trasher and get finished in a day. But uh, some, if you had more corn, then it would be two days. And you'd have... Um, the practice was that the, the local farmers would all help in, you see. And uh, when the threshing would be here, all the neighbours would come themselves or send the men or whatever. Because you'd need you'd need about twenty people minimum. 
for, 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 for refreshing. Because you see, you had to handle all the sheaves and fuck them up, open it up at this mill and all that. Whereas when the combine harvesters came, well, it was a one man job. You go out there and you just with the combine and sit up and drive it on. And um, at the end of the day, you, you, you would have the, the combine would have cut the crop and the, the grain would be separated and would be bagged. And then later on again, the, the, the bags were eliminated. The, uh, there was, there was a, a, a tank on, on the machine and, and the, the grain would flow into the tank. And when the tank was full, you would auger it out and put it into a trailer and bring it in into the mill, local mill or whoever was buying the grain. So it became more or less a, almost a one-man job. And where did you bring the grain from here now? Uh, well, we used to go to Care because Care mills were, were, were functioning at the time. And later on, the, 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 the local co-op, the Mitchestown co-op, they, were, they uh, took over the cream bringing care and we used to bring the grain in there. Nowadays, it only goes down as far as Brits in our film. And that's a good celebration at the end of the day after all the work? Well, I'll tell you, that, that that was to do with, with the old-fashioned way when you had this threshing. Because it was customary to have a, a supply of, of Guinness for the, for the workmen. Uh, the customary thing was to buy a, a quarter cask, you know, and tap it below and You'd have to stop the operation a couple of times during the day then for the lads to slake the toast. <laughs> the quality of the work would improve as the day oh. went on. Can you tell us about the hot combine harvester? Now, well, the first thing I tell you is that it hasn't moved out of the air with, <laughs> with a good number of years. But um, it was a good machine. I had it for, I'd say, about 10 years. But well, unfortunately, the machines, they, as time went on, they got bigger and bigger and bigger and uh, more modern. And a uh, machine like that now would be antiquated. Do you remember where you bought it? I'm pretty certain that it would have been bought from uh, Barlow's in Clonmel. They were the agents for class combines. And what would they have cost? Well, of course, they were very expensive, but uh, uh, I would have bought that and it was second hand. Probably, probably in the region of 20,000. Um, and tell us about the old train. <laughs> I certainly never, never used it for what was in, in, invented for, because it was, it was a, a milk churn that people uh, would use to transport the milk to the local creamery. Be and that was before before modernization so over and, and mm -hmm. now it's all bulk tanks. So it goes straight from the cow into the bulk tank and, yeah. and, 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 the, and the lorry comes and collects it. Whereas in those days when, when that children was new the, the farmers would have to bring the milk to the, to the local creamery. Mm. In a Do you remember what you used to make with the milk? Well, uh, we only sent sent the milk to the to the creamery and and uh, kept a certain amount for the house and to, just to um, you know you needed milk for your tea and that was before the local store was selling bottled milk. It was straight from the cow. <laughs> yeah. Very few farmers with castles. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about it? Hear the sound. 
I, uh, I'm not an expert, but I do know that there was a period in time when there was a lot of castles built in Ireland. And uh, in fact, there was, there was a small grant, small by today's standard, for building a castle. They got the princely sum of ten pounds to build a castle. <laughs> But I suppose uh, it was relatively like for the times that we're in it, you know. But uh, a lot of people come here and they think when they see a castle that there was battles fought here or something. The truth is they weren't. The castle was just a big house, but it was a, it was a fortified one. And... and uh, it was, it was built with that in mind that, that you couldn't, uh, anybody couldn't um, overrun you then. Can you show us some of the parts of the castle? Yes. yes. <coughs> now this, all this was, was the living area of the castle. And uh, you can see these um, keystones. And they were there to support the floor in the next place. And the second row of keystones up there, they supported another one. So you had kind of three levels. Now, all these things were all designed for so that you could defend yourself from the castle. That's why the, the windows are so small and, 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 and tidier when you get down here, so nobody could, get, could, could break in. Now, I just saw your attention to that space up there, because that, and I'll show you how people got into it, they had to be dropped down there. That's a kind of a dungeon. At least they couldn't get down. They couldn't get out of it. Either. Because that hole wasn't there, you see. The cow. The cow. The cow was... And you see... Up, yeah. You see, the whole thing was, was designed like that. That you, you could, could, could defend it, you know. You see, this bit and here is to defend was, now, if you show this, this, this as well. This was the very first... Yeah. First port. If you got through the door... You'd have the well, defence yeah, there. Put it on there now. See, and so, so you could start defending at that point. Because that stretches right back along here for, for a nice little bit. So we had a cow that came up here. And you might struggle to find your way over here now, but the cow found her way. And she went away up here. Why, I never know, but she did. Oh. Yeah. He thought she doesn't. He, he, he doesn't like. Get up, Ivan. Now, as you can see, this is a pretty dangerous place. Because all that, that wall would have been completed, up, at least up to there. And of course, as time went on, yeah, so they just came and knocked away the wall they wanted wanted some nice dressed stone to, to, to build the wall and things that were working. But a cow came up here and we, 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 we saw her and there was two workmen here at the time and I was only young. And uh, they brought her over across there and there's a walk over. And um, 
ties are there for the night. And set about the next morning then trying to get her down out of here. That was a big operation, I think. A big it? operation, yes. Uh, she was a she was young tow. And uh, she had recently calved between a within a week. And they brought up the calf in the hope that she'd be tempted to follow the calf down. But that didn't work. And uh, even before like Nick O'Connor got to go to the man, he was there down on his knees and he trying his best to encourage her in here, but nothing happened. But eventually then on the next morning, when they failed, she didn't follow the calf. They eventually brought up a bucket of water, by which time she was very thirsty and she was tempted to follow the, the, the water back. And that's how they got her down all in one piece. But uh, talk about high notions for a cow. <laughs> <laughs> See these things here now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was done by <coughs> some carbogo that went to the trouble of bringing up black paint and a paintbrush and painting the steps. And I've forgotten what, what was written there, but it wasn't any addition to the base. But, um, See my house. Have you? Now. Well, well, all those houses there, no, they're, they're all built along the side of the road that Lan Mel Affin and all. And uh, other than that, you wouldn't notice unless you saw chaos passing by. You see, all of these castles. They were, they, were, they were built in, in, in such a way that you could see one from, each one could see the others. So you could see from here to Nicholas Town you Castle, would, you would, and, and you could and see to Loch Loher, I'd say. You would see Loch Loher on, 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 on a clear day. Over here, I think, yeah. It's up on that Loch high, high ground there, you know. Yeah. And yeah. could you see Care Castle from here? On no, a, no, no. You could see as far you as could see Care Castle now would have been a different type of castle altogether. Yeah. Uh, and wouldn't, wouldn't, um, it wasn't built up on a height at all, you know. Mm. Oh, yeah, that's good. The Galtys will be heading back up there. The Galtys, yeah. yeah. And over in this direction, then into what? Knockmeal Downs, is it? Knockmeal Downs, yeah. All those Knock mountains Downs. there, Knockmeal Downs. And coming over this way, then, to the Comoros, I suppose, is it? Comoros, yeah. And I think there's the Monavulla Mountains down around Newcastle, I think, then, so all of those ones there. Oh, yeah.